Hello Legionnaires, this is Max Leal from Legion of Myth, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Weaponsmith Discipline in the Earthbound Roleplaying Game. If you've not watched one of my earlier videos titled Earthbound Disciplines and Adepts and Overview, I suggest you take a look as it provides a general overview of what it means to be an adept in the Earthbound Roleplaying Game. Also, check out my previous discipline-specific episode on the Swordmaster to learn about arguably the most iconic discipline in Earthbound. I'll post a link to those videos in the description below. As indicated in previous videos, I will be discussing the Weaponsmith Discipline primarily in terms of 4th Edition Earthon. 4th Edition is the most recent version of the game, and thus the most appropriate version to discuss. Where 4th Edition information is lacking or where comparisons do need to be made, I'll revert to previous editions as needed, mostly 1st Edition because it's what I know best. With that said, Unlike the Swordmaster, which seems to have remained relatively unscathed over the editions, the Weaponsmith apparently gives developers of every edition fits. The Weaponsmith of each edition of Earthdawn is quite different than the Weaponsmith that preceded it. So, with that out of the way, let's forge ourselves an Earthdawn Weaponsmith. Let's start with the background and worldview of the Weaponsmith. So what is the Earthdawn Weaponsmith? I mean, right off the bat, we can pretty much be assured that it's someone who shapes metal into weapons, right? They probably create armor and swords for adventurers, as well as horseshoes, nails, and other metallic necessities. That's a pretty common profession in a fantasy setting. So why would someone desire to play something that in most games is a taken-for-granted NPC? To understand the weaponsmith's role in an adventuring group, we must first understand who the weaponsmith adept is and what makes this a discipline, vice a mere profession? Let's start at the core of the weaponsmith, community. The weaponsmith truly wants to better the community in which he lives, and the magic that empowers the weaponsmith's abilities stems from this desire. I liken them to the adage, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. The weaponsmith is both teacher and toolmaker, Nothing makes a weaponsmith happier than to help others, to forge the bonds of community, and provide the services necessary to ensure the community and the tools the community uses are in good working order, to make the lives of everyone simpler and more comfortable. Weaponsmiths may not have the troubadour's gift of storytelling, the swordmaster's style, or the illusionist's flair. However, more than any other discipline, weaponsmiths are of the people. They speak with the people, learn of their hopes, dreams, and disappointments. Weaponsmiths form their own communities, or guilds, called forges. Every major city includes at least one forge of five or more members with two elders per five members. The bond of the members of a forge is as strong as any family. Any forge member who shows up in need will be helped by the other forge adepts in any way they can. Forges also serve as meeting places, schools for apprentices, and even common areas for the people of the community. When more than one forge exists in a city, they try not to compete with each other, often specializing in one application of the, of the discipline or another. On a more personal level, weaponsmiths are completely committed to everything they do. They are continually finding ways to improve not only the community, but themselves in an effort to forge and temper a better tool person, and life for all. Weaponsmiths also love knowledge, and many will spend an incredible amount of time researching and looking for items of legend. A weaponsmith stays true to his tasks, goal, and word, and will find ways to complete them. A weaponsmith's word is as good as true or a calcum. A promise is forged, not made, and cannot be broken or ignored. The Battle of Wills isn't just a battle against magic and horrors, but an internal one to remain true to oneself, keep one's word, and see all tasks to their natural conclusion. Anecdotally, and this is based on experience, please understand this doesn't mean the weaponsmith cannot ask for assistance. Al contraire, mon ami. If assistance is required to complete a task, a weaponsmith will not hesitate to ask for assistance. If not presented clearly enough previously, weaponsmiths also happily provide assistance, 
as long as the effort provides true benefit, preferably long-term benefit, to the world around them. It's an unfortunate truth that most youth tend toward the swordmaster and warrior disciplines over the weaponsmith, due to the obvious sense of heroism, flash, and action the other disciplines embody. You don't hear nearly as many songs sung of the weaponsmith who forged the blade the warrior used, or how the weaponsmith's forged flesh talent prevented the same warrior from being pierced by a horror's cursed talon. Those who become eventual weaponsmiths usually do so by helping out at the forge for a little extra cash. If the name giver's back, arms, and mental fortitude agree, and she has spent some months at the forge, she may be offered to learn more advanced techniques. At this point, a forge adept will adopt the worker and start the apprenticeship. A weaponsmith's work cannot be of shoddy nature, as that is an insult to both the metal and to the mentor. As such, weaponsmith mentor, weaponsmith mentors are quick to criticize, but slow to praise. As the initiate hammers out countless horseshoes, nails, picks, and shovels of exacting quality with little waste. Not only is the body tempered at the forge during the day, the mind is equally galvanized during the nighttime. The initiate learns about the history and techniques of past weapons and weaponsmiths, as well as the various aspects and nuances of metalworking. After approximately six to eight months of apprenticeship, the initiate and his work are judged by the forge elders. The initiate typically makes something like a dagger, shows off some historical weapon or weaponsmith knowledge, and in my games, I also require them to show some sort of civil service or community support. All right, so here's a quick blurb about the Weaponsmith's Heartblade. I didn't know where to put this in the video. So I'm not going to say too much about the Heartblade, simply because I don't know how 4th edition plans to handle this, if at all. I will say that crafting a Heartblade is arguably the single most important task a Weaponsmith ever sets for herself. Though, to be clear, she may only begin crafting after receiving permission from the Forge Elders. The Heartblade is crafted in eight steps, and the Weaponsmith spends many, many years forging and crafting the Heartblade in order to make it as perfect as possible. As soon as the Heartblade is completed, the Weaponsmith achieves a deeper understanding of her art and herself. Okay, so that's a lot of Weaponsmith background, and most of it was pulled from the first edition book, The Adept's Way, since the subsequent editions didn't or haven't yet explored the Weaponsmith further. So, what does all of this mean when it comes to the Weaponsmith player? What should you expect if you choose Weaponsmith as your character's discipline? The first thing to expect is choice. From my perspective, the Weaponsmith discipline is a jack-of-all-trades master of one, that one being crafting and forging. Depending on how you ultimately forge the character, the Weaponsmith can be crafted for combat, social interaction, or to counter magic. First of all, the Weaponsmith is the only non-magician discipline that can use the Dispel Magic and suppress cursed talents. The Weaponsmith also has the ability to use Astral Sight, Matrix Sight, Perfect Focus, and True Sight, talents that are usually the domain of other magician disciplines. The Weaponsmith has access to the Evidence Analysis talent, making him a great investigator, and the Disarm Trap talent if you're missing a scout or thief. Weapon history and item history used to be separate talents, now they are one and the same under the item history name. This puts weaponsmiths on par with troubadours, and possibly wizards, elementalists, and nethermancers if they choose the talent, in discovering pattern item key knowledges. Not even the nethermancer, who specializes in understanding horrors, receives the confront horror talent as a disciplined talent. Sure, the weaponsmith receives confront horror at circle 15, and most players won't see this ability unless the campaign lasts for years, but it is one of the most heroic talents to look forward to. The Weaponsmith has the ability to enhance other characters. Some of the Weaponsmith's talents take time but are permanent, such as Forge Weapon and Forge Armor, while others are more immediate with shorter duration, like Forge Flesh and Living Weapon. Doesn't Forge Flesh just sound cool? Yeah, yeah that's just the inner nethermancer in me talking. Lastly, if you decide your weaponsmith should be up in the front lines with the warriors, sky raiders, and swordmasters, combat talents such as aura armor, crushing blow, fire blood, and spot armor flaw, among others, may be added to your repertoire. You may not have the full gamut of maneuvers that warriors, sky raiders, and swordmasters have, 
but you are more than capable of holding your own in any fight. Because of all of the potential possibilities involved, I've decided not to include my variations on the theme segment as I normally would. As you've already seen, the Weaponsmith has so many possibilities and potential capabilities that really every one of them is a variation on the theme. In Earth Dawn, half magic represents discipline, pertinent knowledge a character knows and abilities a character can perform simply by being an adept of the discipline. The Weaponsmith may use half magic to care for weapons and armor. She may also use half magic to recognize different types of weapons and armor used or worn by different name giver races or their creators. I'm not going to talk about multidiscipline combinations, their advantages, and their effects, but I will mention that when taking on a second discipline, the Weaponsmith leads towards the Warrior for its determination, the Archer for its devotion to craft, and even the Nethermancer, again for its determination in the face of persecution. On the other hand, Weaponsmiths usually refrain from the Swordmaster's excessive showiness, as well as the Thieves' perceived laziness and antipathy to community. So back to our earlier question. With so many possibilities, I once again ask, what separates the Weaponsmith discipline from a mere profession? Well, let's look at the discipline violations for a potential answer. Remember from my overview video that disciplines are not character classes, professions, or archetypes. They are lifestyles. And while the personal vision of each adept may differ, there are some foundations that must remain. Violating one's personal vision within a discipline may cause a talent crisis. A talent crisis is when the player character loses steps and thus action dice when trying to use talents, effectively cutting the PC off from the discipline. So keep that in mind whenever you're role-playing a weaponsmith. Now, I have to say that there are seemingly a ton of discipline violation examples for the weaponsmith, provided in the first editions, The Adept's Way. However, in truth, most of them are redundant or escalations of previous examples, so I will quickly attempt to oversimplify those examples to these three concepts. Integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all you do. Yes, I just stole that from the United States Air Force's core values. Aim high, air power. <laughs> now, keeping those core values in mind, let's word this a little differently. A weaponsmith must consider forge, community, and companions first. As such, a weaponsmith may not disrespect, steal or withhold from, lie to, or betray the forge, the community, or his companions, may not take unfair advantage of or fail to pay appropriate dues. Oftentimes, this is in the form of foraging, forging, not foraging, or crafting services. And may never abandon or show cowardice if the means to assist exists. On a more individual level, a weaponsmith's word is his bond. Additionally, they set tough but attainable personal goals and objectives and expect to meet them. Lastly, Weaponsmiths always use and care for weapons and tools properly. They do not destroy weapons, especially those from before the Scourge or that are of legendary significance. So while the discipline is arguably one of the most diverse in terms of talents and personalities, there is still a general code of conduct to which a disciplined weaponsmith must adhere, or risk anything from a small and temporary up to a large and persistent penalty to his craft. All right, let's talk a tiny bit about enchanting. I'm not going to get into the game mechanics side of enchanting in this video. If you feel a game mechanics oriented video on crafting and enchanting is warranted, please let me know in the comments below and I can work to create one in the future. With the sole exception being the soup to nuts crafting of a full suit of plate armor, from the iron ingot stage all the way through to tightening the last strap on a troll warrior, I think the rules provided in the Player's Guide and the Earth Dawn Companion are very clear about how to upgrade and enchant weapons and armor. I don't know the answer as to why weapons and armor creation rules are not provided, but some of that may just be up to the players and game masters to work out within their own groups. In my research for this video, there was no actual historical consensus for how long it takes to craft mail or plate armor. So many factors are involved that any answer I give you now here can be argued and countered by another. With that said, let's discuss a few of the enchanting abilities to which weaponsmiths have access. First, alchemy is a skill, so anybody can learn it. A skill that can be used to create blood charms, 
common magic items, and consumables such as healing aids, potions, and similar items. Enchanting, accomplished via the Talent Act system provided in the 4th edition Earth Dawn Companion, is related to the more powerful items with thread magic. Specifically, the Weaponsmith may learn the following Talent Acts based on her rank in the Thread Smithing, Thread Weaving, Talent. At rank 5, the Weaponsmith may learn Handle Elements, as well as Craft True Pattern. At rank 8, she has access to Design Enchanting Pattern. Well, finally at rank 10, she may create or a calcum from the other true elements. All right, with that said, I need to segue. At this point in the video, I'm going to start injecting a lot of opinion regarding my issues with the fourth edition Weaponsmith. This will not be a regular feature of these videos. I'm only doing this for a select minority of disciplines, such as the thief where I feel egregious oversights or errors were made. To be clear, I do not believe all of these problems are singularly tied to fourth edition. As I stated previously, the Weaponsmith has seen major changes in every edition of the game. I really believe the Weaponsmith is a hard discipline to tackle, and I only bring these personal opinions up because I feel, and I'm just one person, that some of what made the Weaponsmith unique in first edition has been diluted by the time we see it in 4th edition. First of all, in keeping with the enchanting theme we just left, alchemy should not be a skill. Outside of acids, poisons, and actual medicine, anything magical should always be a talent, talent knack, or half magic. I know someone will point out that it was a skill in the 1st edition, Magic, a Manual of Mystic Secrets. I hear you. But the alchemy skill there didn't include creation of blood charms. Also, I didn't like it even in first edition when it came to magic items such as healing potions, poultices, and salves. Secondly, I believe that the weaponsmith version of dispel magic should only be usable on magic items, not on spellcasting. As Legion of Myths Heathen Dog stated to me, a disenchant talent would be much more appropriate. I understand one could argue that Steel Thought st sets the tone for the ability to dispel magic. I just believe that dispelling a spell is a bridge too far for the Weaponsmith. Next, I wish some of the buffing talents such as Aura Armor, Steel Thought, and Spot Armor Flaw were offered to fewer disciplines, while allowing the Weaponsmith to use those talents on others, much in the same vein as how Show Armor Flaw worked in 1st edition. Show Armor Flaw is a perfect example of a weaponsmith thinking of others and supporting her companions. It's not even a talent neck in 4th edition. Well, it is in my game. It's based on Spot Armor Flaw at rank 9. Anecdotally, I, I don't even know what to say about Steel Thought, except that it used to be the weaponsmith's bread and butter, before subsequent editions diluted it by offering the talent to other disciplines. When I talk about the first edition Weaponsmith, I always mention Steel Thought as a great reason to play one. What was once the sole realm of the Weaponsmith, now nine, nine different disciplines can claim access. In a similar manner, the first edition version of Spot Armor Flaw was Weaponsmith only. Well, until the cavalrymen attained it all the way up there at 14th Circle. Now seven disciplines can see the weakness in somebody's armor. I think this trivializes the talents and the weaponsmith discipline. On another note, I think it would be more appropriate to bring back the weapon history talent for the weaponsmith vice the homogenized item history talent of today. I struggle with the idea that a weaponsmith can look into the pattern of a painting to obtain key knowledges. A sword, yes. A suit of armor, absolutely. Ancient pottery, ugh, not so much. Where I can envision the sword master as an axe master, stick master, and so on, a weapons master of swords, I cannot view the weaponsmith as a sculptor, painter, or graphic artist. Not as a capital D discipline, anyway. Lastly, if there's only one thing 2nd edition did correctly, it's how it defined the differences between skills and talents. With that said, I would like to see the 4th edition craftsman talent stand out a bit more when compared to the skill. Now, this may be something left up to a GM to handle on a group by group or case by case basis, but the talent should always trump, should always be better than a skill. All right, I'm not going to wrap this up on a negative note. I know I'm going to get some flack for all that. Listen, I love 
what Josh Harrison is doing with 4th edition. And 4th edition Earth Dawn is the game I'm running. I implore you, if you are not playing Earth Dawn, or if you're only playing other editions of the game, you really ought to give 4th edition Earth Dawn a shot. Who knows? Maybe you'll end up being like me as it pertains to Dungeons & Dragons. Personally, I despise 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons and beyond. I only play in 1st and 2nd edition AD&D games. But my opinion is based on years of playing all of the versions of the game, not simply looking at a book cover. With that said, if you give it a shot, I think you'll like 4th edition Earth Dawn. To wrap up this longer than expected video, The Weaponsmith is a very diverse, easy to roleplay, group support discipline. If you enjoy being a support class character who can be viable and extremely capable in combat or social, social situations, The Weaponsmith is for you. The Weaponsmith has always been one of my favorites, second only to the Nethermancer. You will not go wrong having a Weaponsmith in your group. Thank you to YouTube viewer Slash and Burns for the request to make the Weaponsmith video. I thought I knew a lot about the Weaponsmith before putting this all together, but I can honestly say I learned a lot more while making this video for you. I hope every one of you enjoyed this second video in my series that will eventually cover all the primary disciplines in the Earth Dawn setting. Please comment here or come by our Discord channel to let me know what you think of this episode, the Weaponsmith discipline, and the Earth Dawn setting as a whole. If you have a discipline you want me to cover sooner rather than later, please let me know so I can move it to the top of my list. Finally, if you like this video, please subscribe to Legion of Myth channel. It helps us out more than you could know. You can also mash that wonderful little ding dong bell icon to be notified when new videos are uploaded. And with that, I will see you next time, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.